Good evening. Um, first, I'd like to apologize for the wait tonight in getting in. Uh, actually, putting on this event tonight has been quite complicated because we're going to have a, three speakers, and the third one is coming to us from somewhere in the Mediterranean. And I counted them all up. There are at least 10 people who are involved in behind stage in making all this work. Uh, so it's really quite complicated, and we needed some extra time to prepare. Um, tonight, um, well, I'm, I should introduce myself probably. I'm Peter Cornillan, uh, professor of oceanography and one of the coordinators for this year's um, Honors Colloquium. On behalf of myself uh, and my uh, colloquium coordinators, Judah Swift, who is director of the Coastal Institute and professor of communication studies, and Chris Roman, who is a professor of oceanography and ocean engineering and who will also be on the panel tonight, uh, I'd like to welcome you to this, the seventh uh, of the 12 uh, lectures in the public lecture series. Uh, and these lectures are uh, addressing the really quite astonishing uh, technological changes that we're likely to see in the future uh, and the societal issues that these changes uh, will engender. Uh, the sponsors for tonight's lecture, uh, or the major sponsors for tonight's lecture, are the G. Ungerson, G. Unger Fettelson uh, Foundation, the URI Honors Program, and the URI Graduate School of Oceanography, uh, as well as a number of other um, contributors either to specific events or to the colloquium as a whole. Uh, and tonight, uh, as I said, there are more than 10 people involved in putting this together. I'd like to offer a special thanks to the many who have made it possible, specifically people at, uh, individuals at ATR Treehouse, at the Inner Space Center, and Class Media Services. In addition to sponsoring the colloquium as a whole, this is the 50th anniversary of the Graduate School of Oceanography. Uh, and as part of the celebration, we've looked at the past, the present, and the future of oceanography. Tonight's event focuses on a compelling vision of one, of the as of one aspect of this future, uh, a future in which the Graduate School of Oceanography will play a major role. Uh, some rules. First, cell phones off or in vibrate mode, which reminds me. Um, <laughs> Second, uh, as I think I've already told you before, Judith's rule, candy wrappers, open them now. Uh, if you're gonna do any wrinkling or, or rustling, please do it now and get it out of the way so you don't disturb your neighbors. Exits are on the top and the back, in the back here and off to the sides. There are restrooms in the lobby and restrooms uh, downstairs. After the three presentations that we'll have tonight, uh, we'll ask for questions from the audience. Those questions can be submitted in one of three ways. You can either write them on the cards that have been handed out uh, and then pass them to the aisles on the side and put them on the floor and a student will pick them up and bring them to the front. Uh, or you can text them to the numbers on the screen on the side or you can email them to that same number. Uh, there are typically three to 400 um, uh, stream, people streaming in from the outside, so we have actually get a number of questions from the outside as well as locally, which is one reason we do it this way. Please keep your questions short, uh, because we have to read them and understand them, uh, and please put one question per card or text. As many of you already know, a uh, lecture series consists of four parts. The first part focused on sort of a high view, uh, and that involved uh, Raker as well, uh, Peter Schwartz, and Werner Vinge. The second part is focusing on the specific technologies that are going to uh, influence the future. Uh, and th the third part will look at the societal impacts of those technologies. And then the final lecture will be put together by the students in the honors class. Tonight is the fourth of the five lectures examining key technologies in more detail. And the technology on display here uh, will be robotics, with a focus on robotics in the ocean and the atmosphere above. So why, why robotics uh, in the ocean and the atmosphere? Well, the ocean is of major importance to us. It's a source of food, energy, minerals, biodiversity, etc. The atmosphere is equally important. And the two systems, the ocean and the atmosphere, are coupled tightly in some cases and not quite as tightly in others. So to better protect our oceanic and atmospheric environments, uh, Sorry, <coughs> excuse me. 
um, we, need to better we need a better understanding of this coupling of the dynamics of the ocean, uh, upper ocean, and of the lower atmosphere. We believe that this will be a major focus over the next 20 years. Um, we know a, real, a great deal about the surface of the ocean from satellites. Uh, we can look at, uh, we get images, satellite images of sea surface temperature daily, actually twice daily, cloud permitting, clouds permitting. We see, we get weekly images of sea surface height. Uh, we can uh, get daily images of the wind over the oceans. We can see waves in the ocean, which are really quite remarkable. They're waves that have a wavelength from, say, here to Washington, D.C., uh, and an amplitude of a few inches, like this. And yet these waves bring, bring, carry across the ocean uh, enormous amounts of information that's put into the ocean by the atmosphere. We can see all these with satellites. But we know remarkably little about the interior of the oceans and about the atmosphere above as well as the interface itself. Uh, and so, uh, and the reasons for that uh, are that the ocean, the atmosphere are three-dimensional structures. It's pretty easy to see a two-dimensional structure with, uh, with satellites. Uh, and it's a three-dimensional structure. The ocean is pretty much opaque uh, to at least light. Uh, you can see things acoustically in it, but it's a very hard environment to measure in. So we need other ways of measuring, and robotics, we believe, is going to be one of the ways that are going to do a lot of the measurements. Ships do measurements, too, but they're really expensive. A ship runs from twelve to $30,000 a day. Um, and so we see, we envision robotics as playing a major role in the future. Tonight, we have three panelists who will address various aspects of robotic sampling of the ocean and the atmosphere. Each will give a 15 to 18 minute presentation and will then entertain questions from the audience. The panelists are James Bellingham, who got his PhD from MIT in 1988. He's the chief technologist at the Ambari, at the Marine, I'm sorry, at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute in Monterey. He develops AUVs, uh, underwater robots uh, that navigate without acquiring the input, without requiring the input of a, an operator. And he's co-founder of Bluefin Robotics Corporation, which is a leading manufacturer of AUVs for the military, commercial, and scientific markets. Uh, our second panelist tonight is Jim, is Joe Sion. Uh, he has a Ph.D. in meteorology from North Carolina State. He's a research meteorologist at the NOAA's, Her NOAA's Hurricane Research Center. Uh, and he specializes in studies of the atmosphere and oceanic boundary layer, uh, thermodynamic processes and hurricanes and extra tropical winter storms. In 2005, uh, in conjunction with NASA and Aerosan Corporation, uh, Joe conducted the first unmanned aerial system flight into the core of a major tropical storm. And in 2007, uh, he flew a record duration, 17.5 uh, hours, uh, at 82 meters of an unmanned vehicle uh, in directly into the center of a hurricane. And our third panelist tonight is Chris Roman. He got his PhD from MIT as well, uh, MIT in joint program in 2005. He's an assistant professor of oceanography and ocean engineering here at URI, specializing in ocean uh, robotics. And he currently leads the imaging and mapping group associated with the EV Nautilus um, ocean exploration. And he'll actually be broadcasting tonight from the Nautilus. Uh, and he can hear us now, I think. Uh, Chris is also developing robotic uh, oceanographic floats for coastal seafloor imaging and adaptive water column profiling. And uh, he's co-coordinator of the Honors Colloquium this year. So without saying anything more, Jim, you're on. Uh, so first we have Jim Bellingham, who is going to talk to us about sensing in the ocean with robots. Well, it is a, uh, it's really been a wonderful day here. I, I had uh, the advantage of arriving a day early, and so I got a chance to go to the honors class and meet, uh, and meet the students who are, who are part of this program. And as depressing as, uh, as the news is sometimes in the newspaper, you only need to come to a place like this to realize that, uh, in fact, the future is, uh, the future is bright. I, I'm going to be talking about uh, my, my great passion, which is really applying robotics to the exploration of the ocean. Uh, I think it's a, 
It's something which really captured me in, uh, in my early days. And in fact, uh, this picture here really is sort of the time for me when I suddenly realized that, wow, this, this exploration of the ocean is something I really want to spend a, a, a good chunk of my life doing. It's, it's an enormously big place. Uh, there's untold wealth in the ocean. Uh, and at the same time, it's a very remote and very hard place to work. So here we are in an icebreaker. Uh, in the Southern Ocean, in this particular case, uh, and just about every piece of equipment on board has been broken. And the reason the ship is turning there to come out of the ice is because that's it. The only thing left working is the air gun. You can see sort of back behind there. And we're going to sort of move on out of the ice and try to fix it. And it was sort of at this point that, a after having, I don't know, how many days of no sleep, that I realized that this was something that was really uh, an incredible challenge uh, an incredible environment, and I, and, I wanted, and I wanted to spend more time doing it. So I think, though, that, that uh, there are a couple of transitions going on, or in a way, a transformation of our overall human relationship with the ocean. Uh, part of that is really driven by need, uh, but part of it's also driven by technology, and I think robotics is, is a large part of that story. But first, need. I, I think, I think uh, you don't have to look far to realize that uh, we're in some cases, consuming uh, terrestrial resources that are, that are not replaceable. But of course, the ocean covers two-thirds of the planet, so once you consume those resources in the terrestrial environment, you can turn to the ocean. And so oil is an early example of that. Uh, oil, sort of the largest oil and gas finds uh, in recent years have been in the offshore environment. And so you can see that this might be a pattern for other types of resources, mining, deep sea mining, which was kind of a big thing back in uh, the 70s, uh, but then faded, is now re-emerging, but in a very different form, going after sulfide deposits, for example, rather than manganese nodules. So the ocean is a source of resources. Uh, it's, also, it's also been very important to our national defense. In, in the early history of our country, it was a barrier. Uh, it, was a, uh, it, w it made our country sort of a harder place to get to. More recently, it's been a place uh, which we've used, uh, we've used to our advantage uh, as a way to project power, as a place where we could hide uh, our systems uh, and preserve, in effect, preserve a threat, if you will, to anyone who might attack our country. And in fact, a lot of the funding for the ocean sciences ha it, you know, really uh, came about because of this national defense imperative. Part of the change is that this imperative, to some degree, has gone away. It was really driven by Cold War concerns, which aren't so true in the world today. Uh, our, our concerns with the ocean are really rather different. And so here's kind of a picture, two pictures, if you will, of the, uh, of the world's oceans. Uh, the upper left is the catches per hundred hooks of, uh, of a predator of a fish uh, in 1958. Uh, and the red there are large numbers of catches. And then down in the uh, right-hand uh, right corner are the catches per 100 hooks in 1999. And what you can see is the fish catches have plummeted. Uh, we're actually consuming a lot of the ocean resources. A lot of the things that we do as humans have enormous effects on the ocean. And the ocean is, to many, in many respects, kind of invisible to us. I mean, we think of it as the ocean near our coastal communities, or the surface of the ocean, which we see from a ship when we're out there. But in fact, it's this enormous reservoir of life, which is on average almost four kilometers deep. And we're having, a, and our actions have, have, of course, enormous consequences there. And these consequences are, as I said, transforming how we interact with the ocean. So this chart I love, it shows, uh, it shows the transition of hunter-gatherer to cultivation in the terrestrial environment as measured by the number of species which are, in effect, domesticated. And on the left-hand side, those two curves uh, here basically show uh, land animals and uh, land plants. And down here on the bottom, this is 10,000 years ago. This is 1,000 years ago. So we started making the transition to farming here uh, uh, a very long time ago. Here's what's happening in the ocean. In the ocean, we're on the upswing, in effect, of domestication, and that's starting about 100 years ago, and that's 10 years ago uh, at the time of the writing of this. This is an incredible transformation, and why does it take 10,000 10, years for this to occur? Well, part of it, again, is because the ocean is such a difficult and challenging place to work. So the challenge is, is that, well, I mean, humans are basically, we're expensive 
to maintain in, in remote and hostile environments. It takes an entire icebreaker to take us to those parts of the world. And by the way, the high latitudes are mostly closed to us for, for winter. So those oceans, we don't even, we, in, in a practical sense, we don't even go to for a good part of the year. So we require equipment, we require consumables, it's expensive to move us there, it's expensive to keep us there alive. And this is really kind of the motivation for robotics. And so as a consequence, the ocean science community, although we are not, uh, we, we, we don't actually spend an awful lot of money on technology development, we've actually focused a lot of what our, our interests are on developing a lot of different types of robots. So up here, this is a, this torpedo looking thing is actually an autonomous underwater vehicle. That thing weighs about a half a ton. Uh, there's various versions of this some, of this, some of which carry mapping sonars down to 6,000 meters. This is kind of the other extreme. That's a little drifter there. It only weighs a few tens of kilograms, uh, but it lasts in the ocean for, for years. This is a laboratory in a can. It's not a robot in the sense that it moves around and grabs things, but it's very much a robot in the sense of it's a heavily automated system, and it can actually do DNA fingerprinting of organisms in situ. This whole stage here is capable of carrying out complicated analysis and has a microscope, it has an oven, and it telemeters data back to shore. Of course, we are very dependent on satellites. Uh, not many people realize it, but a large fraction of our data and our understanding, our, our investment really in ocean observing resources is really in satellites. This is a remotely operated vehicle. It has a tether, it's attached to a ship, and so as a consequence, it's a, it's a, it's a robot which really requires a lot of human uh, interaction and supervision, but when you have it, you can go down to the deep seafloor and accomplish really tremendous things, and it can stay there for extended periods. I think we'll be hearing a lot about that from uh, Chris Roman towards the end of it. A mooring system might be deployed for years on end, and here's, here's actually another ROV, remotely operated vehicle, being used for constructing equipment on the seafloor. So this is all unattended equipment, which actually is gonna be connected by, by tether to shore. So the story is, Robotics are really beginning to be an integral part of how we study the ocean. We're making a large investment in them. We're developing new types of systems tailored to particular, to particular tasks. And there's been a pretty rapid rate of progress. So my little microcosm, uh, this is me here. Uh, oops, uh, there, there I am uh, looking a lot younger and thinner. Uh, and uh, I'm next to my first robot you know, back in, back in the, late, the late 80s. Uh, that vehicle could go a few kilometers. It almost didn't carry any sensors at all. It was really sort of a software test bed. Now, there were other vehicles that had been built at, at, uh, at about that time. As a matter of fact, the first AUV was built at uh, University of Washington, uh, their applied physics lab, but it actually hadn't stayed operational. So about this time in 1989, there were maybe a few dozen uh, different AUVs that had been built over the years, but none of them had actually stayed in operation. They had all been kind of demonstration. Uh, AUVs today are used routinely uh, in the ocean sciences. Here's our latest vehicle. Uh, it weighs uh, about 110 kilograms. Uh, in contrast to a few kilometer range, we just recovered this last week after an 1,800 kilometer a voyage uh, off of the coast of California, and it carries a range of physical, chemical, and biological sensors, and while it's out there, we interact with it by satellite, uh, look at the data, and decide what we're gonna do. As a matter of fact, this, is, this was as much as I enjoy going to sea. It's also really cool waking up in the morning, and as you're sort of having your cup of coffee, looking and seeing what your robot did last night, and looking at all of the data. It's, uh, it's definitely, a uh, certain level of satisfaction there. So let me take you, you know, you need some equations here. So uh, this is, you know, here we are at, at, a, at a university setting. I'm just gonna give you a quick synopsis of one of the things that really sort of drives how we build our robots and why we run them the way they do. One of the fundamental problems we have is we can't run them on gasoline engines. We have to run them on batteries. And batteries actually are not a great way to store energy in terms of the amount of energy per kilogram. And so we have to really be, and not only that, of course, water is a very dense and viscous medium, and so it costs us a lot of energy to move through it. And so what this equation up here says is the way we think about running a survey in the ocean environment, so here's our little AUV and it's running sort of a lawnmower survey, is it's gonna take me a certain amount of time to accomplish that survey, and I'm gonna spend my energy partly on propulsion, 
and partly on hotel load, and this is kind of really a naval architecture term, but we'll just say that's everything is not propulsion. It's kind of a constant number, and it's usually related to the payload. Now, a lot of times what happens is, is you want to get the survey done in a hurry, so you run it fast, so most of your power is actually going to propulsion. Well, propulsion power actually goes as velocity cubed. So if I wanted to double the speed of the survey, that would cost me eight times as much energy. But let's say that I, so let's say that I decide how much time it's, I, I have to run that survey. What happens if I put two AUVs in to do the same survey? Well, what happens is if I hold that survey time constant, uh, what I do is each of these vehicles only has to run half the distance. That means they run half the, at half the velocity. That means I drop the power for each vehicle by a factor of eight. That means that I'm, overall, with two vehicles, I'm consuming a quarter of the power that I am with one vehicle here. Now, of course, it gets a little more complicated when you're actually consuming a hotel, but the point is, is completely non-intuitively, a lot of times more vehicles can do, uh, can accomplish more, uh, uh, more with a smaller amount of energy. And so that's, uh, that was sort of one of our early realizations that really drove us towards multi-platform systems. And so here, let me get this little video playing. Uh, this is actually a field program that we ran, uh, which was, uh, was uh, a lot of times in the ocean sciences, by the way, we run these big field programs, and what you do is you invite all your friends. And it's a bit like a potluck. They all bring their instruments, and we all sort of have a marvelous uh, oceanographic field program, which is built out of all of the different uh, oceanographic instruments that people have brought. And what you're looking at here are gliding vehicles. So here's a group operating in tandem. Uh, there's a propeller-driven vehicle there, there's a couple of ships in there, there's an aircraft, uh, uh, there's a couple of drifters over here. There's a lot of different systems in here. And so this is basically the way the ocean sciences is beginning to evolve. We're beginning to sort of develop specific platforms oriented around certain measurements, really optimized for certain measurements, and in order to get sort of a comprehensive picture of what's going on in the underwater environment, we're operating them in large, we're operating them in large numbers. We're creating these fleets of, of robots. Now this, this sort of brings me to sort of a, a little bit of a, a, a theme of specialization and cooperation. So I think that that one interesting analogy here is to think of these collective groups of robots as a little bit like a robotic civilization. After all, uh, what, what really sort of allowed human civilization? Well, human civilization really involved uh, two things. It involved mobility. It involved the uh, ability for groups in different geographic locations to interact. Uh, and it involved specialization. So a group, uh, a particular village could specialize on perhaps producing ore, another village could uh, be the blacksmith village. And then if one of the blacksmiths fell off, the, off a cliff, it wasn't sort of the only blacksmith fell off the, in the village fell off the cliff, and now you're back in the Stone Age, it's just you've got a bit of resiliency. And so this is kind of the idea of what you might do with these underwater vehicles. Our early underwater vehicles were very much, you know, they had to do everything. So they had to take care of themselves in the ocean environment, and they had to operate on their own. Increasingly, the way we're thinking of our next generation of robots is they're part of an infrastructure, and that infrastructure itself might be robotic in nature. And so here is sort of one of the types of things that you might do, and I know there's people around uh, here which are working on this problem. But basically, what you would observe is, well, uh, you, know, you're, you're, you know, I just told you that energy is one of our chief problems. On the other hand, you're out there in the ocean environment, and, and it's a violent environment. There's waves, there's wind, there's a lot of sun. It's full of, it's full of energy. If we can just figure out how to harness that energy and turn it into something useful for us. And in fact, a lot of people are working on this. There's a beautiful little system called the wave glider, which I was talking with about folks today, which actually use waves uh, to travel long distances. It just turns wave energy to propulsion. This is solar energy here. Uh, yeah, this is sort of a January number. Peaks out at about 350 watts. Here's wind, which peaks out at about 3,000 watts per uh, square meter. And then here's wave, and kind of the peaks here are close to 100 kilowatts per, per, per linear meter, uh, uh, since you look at waves along the surface of the ocean. So a, it basically, the story is, is that there's a lot of energy out there in the ocean environment. Now, you wouldn't want your AUV spending all of its time on the surface generating 
uh, uh, electrical energy from wave power, but if you had a buoy up there generating a lot of energy from wave power, then what you might want to be able to do is come along with your AUV, dock with that mooring system, and recharge your vehicle. And now your vehicle doesn't have to be recovered to shore or to a ship. It can stay out a much longer period of time. And in fact, uh, those are the types of capabilities we're working on. So here's just a, a little video showing you of some, some, of, our, some of the docking work uh, and there's a number of organizations working on this, but this is our Dorado vehicle. That's kind of the half a ton sort of size vehicle, 21 inch diameter system. It's going down uh, in the, uh, the launch here in the Monterey environment. And here's our docking system. This docking system is actually attached to a cable and we're watching this from shore as the vehicle comes in and docks with it. When it gets into the dock, it establishes a connection. Uh, it passes all its data back to us. We recharge its batteries. Uh, we can change its mission, or we can put it to sleep and leave it there for a period. Uh, and then here we go, you know, we're launching it again, and uh, out it goes uh, off to do, uh, to do another, another operation. So these are the kinds of things. Now, this is a lot more complicated in a sense. This is sort of a two-robot system, ideally, in the long run, interacting with each other, and it requires a lot more sophistication in the development of robotics. But I think it's a direction we're going. Now, I think that, that one of the other things that, that I really would be remiss if I didn't point out was there are a lot of challenges which come with developing these, uh, these very uh, robotic-intensive and data-rich systems. And in fact, uh, our, uh, our host here tonight, uh, uh, Peter, has, a, has a, uh, a, a long history and is one of the pioneers, really, of this field. But basically, when you start generating this much data, when your systems are this complicated uh, uh, that you're operating at sea, scientists start doing their science, we think, in a different way. And this is yet another transformation which is going on. There's a fellow, Jim Gray, uh, who unfortunately uh, was, was lost at sea on a, uh, a sail, sailboat, but uh, Jim gave a talk in which he coined this term, uh, the fourth paradigm. And what he said was, he said, science, uh, you know, a thousand years ago was empirical, it was about describing the world around us, and the last few, hun you know, few hundred years, we got to the point where we started using the mathematics to create sort of theoretical frameworks. And so we had a theoretical evolution of science, the second paradigm, and now, particularly you can think of climate science, it's really computational in nature. You, do, you don't really model the climate c uh, system analytically, you model it with a very sophisticated uh, computer model, and we'll hear about that, I'm sure, uh, those types of models in, the, in, uh, in our next talk. And today what's happening is there's yet sort of another stage of science um, um, emerging, another kind of science uh, emerging, which is about data exploration. It's about scientists who don't really sort of go out and do an experiment. They actually work with all of the data coming from all of these dis different devices, and they specialize in synthesizing what's going on out there. It's a really different way of doing science. It involves a different culture. It involves different reward systems. Uh, but ultimately, uh, I think we all depend on this for telling us, in effect, what's going on on our planet and developing the tools to make predictions ab about the future. So I have a few final thoughts here, and uh, I think you know I'll just sort of make my predictions. Human activity in the ocean is going to dramatically increase uh, in the coming decades. A lot of it is going to be driven by, by just the needs of a, a growing population of the planet. I think we're going to be requiring uh, ocean-spanning interactive observatories. We require that to understand our climate, and we're going to understand, need that to understand human impacts coming from these other activities. Robotics will play a central role, and indeed will be an enabler in those. And they're going to really revolutionize how we think of the ocean, right? The ocean won't be so invisible anymore. So, so we're, going to have a, we're going to have a clearer scientific access to the ocean, but at the same time, it's going to make the ocean far easier to exploit. And in a race between this and this, uh, well, we're usually better at exploiting things than we are at understanding things. And, uh, and I think that may be a, a topic of discussion for a little bit later. So I think with that, I will uh, leave off and uh, allow the uh, next speaker to uh, take the podium. Uh, let's see. Okay, let's get it up there. Somehow we missed, uh, well, first of all, I guess I'll introduce myself. My name is Joseph Sion. I work 
at NOAA's uh, research, Hurricane Research Division in Miami. And since we're talking about the future, I guess I came here and this is an immediate future for me because this is our peak winter weather. We don't get any, uh, any, any sort of weather like this. This is about as cold as it gets for us. So um, I'm enjoying it, though. I love it. Um, we, uh, we put the slides together here, and actually my first slide is not there. So I'm just going to jump on to the second slide. Um, basically, what I'm going to talk to you today about is using unmanned vehicles to study hurricanes. Um, but you can make that, uh, a, a, in a broad sense, uh, our interest in using unmanned vehicles to study any sort of severe weather or weather conditions or climate type observations that are in remote settings. But before I talk about uh, the current unmanned uh, fleet that we have, we really have to pay homage to our manned fleet um, for several reasons. Without the manned fleet, we wouldn't be where we are now with the technological capabilities uh, that we're exploring. Um, and secondly, we're in a transition zone too. And a lot of these aircraft, these manned assets that we have, we can use to leverage uh, to really develop the unmanned capabilities that will be our future. So the current aircraft that uh, we have up here are the Air Force C-130s, otherwise known as Hurricane Hunters. You may have heard that term before. You guys just had a little uh, exploit here with your own tropical system recently. Um, it was pretty wimpy. I know it did, had, did some damage there, but uh, really quite lucky this, that that thing uh, uh, could have been a lot worse. Um, which points to another thing that we really can't forecast too well. Um, and that's another reason that we're here. We're trying to get additional observations. And I think we have a lot of reasons as to why uh, our forecasts and our ability, particularly to predict the intensity change, how much stronger or weaker a system will get, has a lot to do with our observational capability, which links nicely to this talk. So the two workhorses, if you will, are the, the uh, Air Force C-130 the NOAA P-3s, which I work with NOAA, um, I've flown on that aircraft uh, uh, many times in many hurricanes, and those, those planes go through the storm, right through it, not over it, not around it, right through. Now, the aircraft here, um, I think this is a pointer, yeah. The aircraft here that's the NOAA G-4, it's essentially a corporate jet outfitted with uh, some instrumentation, uh, that, uh, some meteorological instrumentation, and the ability to drop uh, we call drop sons, which are sensors that are dropped out of the belly of the aircraft and then uh, measure atmospheric constituents as they fall to the earth. This one goes around the system. So as you might imagine in a corporate jet, you don't want to be flying through a hurricane. So uh, the other aircraft here, we just don't have time. I won't talk about it, but we have our part. Uh, we work closely with NASA. Uh, NASA uh, does a lot of experimentation with us. Uh, every three or four years, we have projects with them. And these are some of the aircraft that they use. So the Hurricane Hunter, which is known as, as I said, the C-130, really does operational data. A lot of this data that we collect it can be put into two bins. It's kind of neat. Really, they overlap. But there's an operational use, sort of a, we need this information now. We have a storm out there now. We need to know where it's going. We need to know how strong it is. We need to put warnings out to save lives uh, and protect property. Um, and this is the, the focus of this aircraft. Um, NHC, you'll see a lot of acronyms. I'll try to explain them uh, as I go through them here. That's the National Hurricane Center in Miami. And they're a little different than my shop where we're look, concentrating on a lot of research and trying to understand the systems. They want that too, don't get me wrong. They, they, they like understanding, but they want to know where the system is and how strong it is. And that's, that's the focus of this aircraft. They have 12, the, uh, there are 12 aircraft that do this. Um, and uh, um, I'm actually going to go to this one in a second. I'll come back to that. And this is our equivalent of that aircraft, as I said, the, the, the workhorse, which is the NOAA P-3 aircraft. Um, we also do operational, but our focus over the last 25 to 30 years, these came out in 1977, uh, so yeah, they're getting old, um, but we refit them out uh, and obviously make sure they maintain the safety of the aircraft. Um, but we are more heavily outfitted to look at the research aspects. We have Doppler radar on board. Uh, we have uh, something called step frequency microwave radiometer, which looks at the sea surface temperature, uh, sea surface, uh, uh, the winds right at the sea surface. We have AXBTs, which also uh, allow us to drop probes to measure the ocean. So we're interested not just the atmosphere, we're looking at the ocean as well. And our gear is, is really to not necessarily produce a forecast for what the storm's going to do, but over a long period of time to understand how these systems work. Uh, and as I said before, our ability to do intensity research 
I mean, intensity forecasting is really stymied um, by, by a lack of understanding. And to, to tap into a, a theme that we've been hearing about the ocean being a difficult environment, well, imagine the ocean and the atmosphere uh, in a hurricane environment. Uh, and you guys are talking in a clear air environment and just getting out there, hey, it's far, uh, we're going to use robots to get there, it's, it's a salty environment, but now throw in 50-foot waves and 100-mile-an-hour winds, and oh yeah, we have these planes here, hundreds and hundreds in cases, maybe 1,000 miles away from shore. It's, uh, it's enough to make me uh, reclassify my job as almost a first responder. I mean, sometimes uh, we're, we're happy to get back, let's just put it that way. Um, but the, the problem that we have is that uh, we don't really understand that environment um, uh, fully. And I'll get into the areas where we think we have the, the, a bang for a buck. We really think we can improve our understanding. Before I go to that, though, and this links into another type of UAS I'll talk about later, this is our manned aircraft, the, G, the G4 I told you about. And it goes, here's that, whoop, that symbol. Here's the hurricane symbol, and this is Florida here. And this is the pattern, I don't know if you can see it, it's in green, that, that this, the, um, the G4 will go around the storm, as I said, it won't go in it. So this gives us the environment, and the focus of this aircraft is to tell us where the track is. Okay, as I said, the other two have a different focus. Um, so just, uh, you say, well, what kind of instrumentation? I won't spend a lot of time on this. But, uh, you know, we have uh, a Doppler radar on board, which tells us the three-dimensional wind structure around wherever the aircraft goes. We have the step frequency microwave radar. This is the center of the storm here. And these are the winds in red that are measured by that uh, remote sensing device that looks down. And these are the winds that are measured from the aircraft itself. And it's nice, they match up pretty well. There's a difference, but that's supposed to be there. Trust me on that. And uh, here's the rain rate that we see too. So we have a lot of instrumentation. Um, and uh, when we go to an, an unmanned system, you know, it's a lot, it's a trade off. There's trade offs of, uh, you know, these aircraft can, we, we have limitations, we can't go as far per se but we also have uh, benefits of having in incredibly state-of-the-art instrumentation. So it's, a, it's kind of a balancing act, as you'll see. Uh, do, how can we still get the information we need or improve the information, but still not degrade what we have now? So here's an example of the best sample storm we've ever had. It was Hurricane Earl last year. And um, if you can't tell here, here's the United States here. And these are different, uh, different uh, uh, missions that we had. And essentially, this is as close to continuous measurements that we've ever had. So hey, it's fine. Why do you need type, a different type of sampling? What's going on? Why are you complaining about? Well, the reality is that, uh, a lot of words here, but the bottom line is that that's rare. We don't get that. We have plenty of gaps. And in our science, we look at unmanned systems and robotic technology really to fill in critical gaps. The two aircraft, the, heavy, the, the ones I said were the, the, the aircraft that really sample the storm and go through, we have eight-hour flights. Maybe we have three hours on mission. That's not a lot. Uh, and uh, for, the, for um, systems that are far away from land, we just simply can't get there. So we have limitations that, uh, that uh, really um, uh, limit us. The second limitation, and this is one near and dear to my heart, I know we're heavy on the oceanography, but I'm an air-sea interaction guy, so I have my feet in the water and my head in the air, so I, I think I can qualify for both. Um, that area is critical for a couple of reasons. First of all, what's called the boundary layer. The, really, the, the atmospheric boundary layer is where we all live. When a storm makes landfall, we care about it because the winds that are there are impact us, impact our lives directly. But it's also important for the storm to understand the storm because that's where the energy comes from. And it's not as simple as, hey, you know, you may see this on, the, on TV too, and I, I, it's one of my pet peeves where it's, well, you got a warm ocean, there it goes, there's storm's going to be strong. It's a lot more complicated than that. You need to flux that energy out of the ocean. And in order to do that, you need to know what the atmosphere just above it looks like. So I've been an air-sea guy my whole life. I, I started, uh, I grew up in New York, so I know winter storms, and that's what got me excited uh, as a kid. And I eventually got into this field. And as I got older, I realized that we really don't have a lot of data down there. We don't really understand what's going on there. So that's what got me into unmanned vehicles. So when I first got to the Hurricane Center, uh, we, uh, Hurricane Research Division, we really didn't have these observations. So this next plot shows us, well, where are we as far as where the aircraft can go and where are the gaps? The biggest gap from the air-sea interaction standpoint is, as you guessed it, right at the surface, right near the surface, because we can't get these observations any other way in a continuous mode. We can drop sensors that give us a snapshot, think of a picture taking, like that, 
or we can take these small uh, uh, remote vehicles and sample in a, in a movie. Think of a movie versus a snapshot. And that's all the difference, because the atmosphere changes very quickly. And in order to capture how much energy comes out of the ocean or how the wind's changing, we really need to measure very quickly. The ocean is slow. The ocean moves and changes, but the, the variability of the atmosphere, the density is so much less that you, you, you get tremendous amounts of change over a short amount of time. And if we don't capture that change, we don't know how much energy comes out. If we don't know that, we can't predict intensity change with any real hope of getting it extremely accurate. And in my opinion, this is one of the frontier areas where we really have to push forward, and I think that unmanned vehicles really represent that. Now, you'll see some specifics here. There's, a, there's an aircraft called Gale. Um, there's an aircraft called Aerosond, which is the one that uh, Peter introduced me with. The first time we ever flew in a, in a storm was with the Aerosond. Uh, and the Gale represents, uh, this was about a 30-pound plane. Well, instead of telling you, let me, let's go to it. Here's the Aerosond. Okay, now this is about a 30-pound uh, plane, about 10 feet across. These are low altitude. They all get into that area that I was talking about, the, the boundary layer environment. But this is a long duration. It can last 18 hours. So you think of it as a land-launched UAS where we bring it to some remote location. It could be an island in Barbados, or it could be, we actually did it in Virginia. And then it would fly off, do its thing, and you, know, you pray, and it comes back, and it did come back. Um, these other ones here, which after years of doing this, I realized, you know, a better con op, we call concept of operation, is to actually take our manned aircraft, because we have that, right? Leverage that asset, bring it to the storm, and then launch it. So this is very, very much cutting technology. We have not done this yet. We are testing these two. One's called the Coyote, one's called the Gale. Uh, and then this big daddy over here is very different. This is very expensive. This is us leveraging in another way. I'm sure everyone here has heard about the, the, the UAVs we use in, 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 uh, in theater, if you will, in war. It's a nice way to say in war. Um, well, a lot of these global hawks uh, um, and predators uh, are used over there, and then they get decommissioned, and NASA had the ability to grab a couple of these things, and now we've outfitted them with our instrumentation. So this is a great uh, uh, way to show that we can transition the resources that we put in one area of the government and use it in another area. That aircraft takes, think of it as a uh, upgrade over that G4 plane that goes around the storm, and I'll show you. So the first two are down low, a big area, and the other one takes a, takes a gap that we have um, uh, uh, around the system. Just quickly, uh, as I said, we had some success. This is uh, with the Aerosond. I have a couple of videos. I don't know if I'm gonna have the time to show you, but I can show you these things. That the, the Aerosond launches off a car, actually. It, you have a remote control. It looks like it, some kid playing a remote game. It's true, he actually controls it until it's line of sight, then it's gone. Then we go to satellite, and we, we control it by satellite that way. It's very different than the Gale that you'll see later. We, uh, this is the first ever, these, these flights were the first ever missions into a tropical cyclone. I still need to contact Guinness to get in that book, but haven't done that yet. Uh, the payload specs, I don't want to spend too much time, basically it goes about 60 miles an hour. Uh, you know, it can go, actually we can sprint it pretty quick. 60 miles an hour, I will say, this thing, these are small planes, so they go into circulation of the wind. So 60 miles an hour is the plane, if you've got 100 mile an hour winds, you're going 160 miles an hour. So your ground speed is quite different than the plane. And no, we can't go the opposite way, you know, it's not happening. So it, it's good and it's bad. It's actually, you, you save a lot of energy because you let, essentially, to, harness, to, to bring up your point, you're harnessing a lot of the natural energy that's there. And also, those aircraft I showed you before, the P3s and the Hurricane Hunters, they fly f f figure fours and do these uh, orthogonal runs, and that's how they do They punch through. We get to get observations in the eyewall where the strongest winds are, so the scientists and, the, and a lot of the meteorologists are excited about this kind of stuff as they should be. So that's, now the Coyote and the, and the Gale is very similar to this. I'll lump them together. That thing was 30 pounds. This thing's about eight pounds. Now we're in the middle of testing this. We had a test flight in 2009 in the clear air, not in a hurricane. And we dropped it here. I don't know if you can see it. This is altitude. We dropped it with the P3. This is the P3 chute. This drops the AXPTs, again, leveraging existing assets. So this is where the chute we use to, to measure the ocean. So we dropped the ocean probes here, but we said, I, I partnered up with the Navy about five years ago. I said, you guys drop your, because by the way, the Navy is a P3 plane. That's what they used to be sub-hunting. That's what these were for. 
we got our P3s by basically getting them from the Navy. So they dropped these things to, to, to measure the ocean, to, to hunt for subs, and that, do that sort of thing. But they were interested in UAS-2, so they paid many millions of dollars to develop this type of aircraft that uses this tube. And then, of course, we came in and said, hey, thanks for doing all the prep work, we'll take some. And uh, that's where we jumped in. So uh, this thing was dropped down about 10,000 feet, and then we command and control it down. This is 1,000 feet, and we told it to do these up, up and down maneuvers, profiling, and then eventually it went away. So these are, at this point, expendable. The Gale is an ongoing partnership with Embry-Riddle. It's very similar. This looks a little more sleek, doesn't it? This is, a, this is even lighter. That was 15 pounds, the last one. This is 8 pounds. So we keep shrinking down and down. Very, very similar technology. Uh, it can actually sprint a lot faster than, you know, 100 knots in this thing. Um, and it communicates uh, to the mothership when we drop it out of the aircraft, so it can communicate that way, but it also has satellites, something called iridium, that can, can communicate via satellite. It uh, shrinks down. Again, I have a video of this, too. Again, we'll see if we have time at the end, um, where it, it, so it can fit in that tube. Uh, and then you have this very strong and lightweight mylar wings, uh, and we have the, 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 the sensors that we need, the MISON sensor, We've got the GPS and autopilot uh, capabilities here, and it's, it's quite, it's quite the, uh, uh, the sophisticated eight-pound vehicle, if you will. We plan on testing it this spring, um, and then we're hopefully actually test it in a hurricane this, this summer. So this is like the near-term future. Um, and we're still in very much demo mode, though. So what are we going to do with this thing? Well, we're going to drop it in the eye of the storm. Okay, now what you're looking down is, imagine this is the center, this is the eye of the, the, eye of the storm here, and this is where the strong winds are. These, this is the eye wall, and the winds go counterclockwise. Don't forget that, unless we're in the southern hemisphere, then I'd have to rotate it, but we're not. So we would drop, this is the pattern. Again, remember the pattern that the P3 does over here is very, you know, these linear lines. We would drop it and then let it actually cycle out uh, and then actually jump into the eye wall and do this. We've never been able to do this before. And again, this gives us that information in that boundary layer environment to give us the winds, to get better forecast, not even just forecast, now cast. It tells us, a lot of times they're guessing. They don't want to hear me saying that. Hopefully no one's in the hurricane center in the audience here. But, you know, a lot of times they say, well, we think it's 100 knots. Is it? You know, I, I, we don't know. Remember, these things, the, the aircraft that we have now, fly quick, drop something in, and they're gone. Snapshot, and they're not even flying down there. These things are going to be in the soup, if you will, and really can give a better estimate of what's going on. So you've got an immediate payoff, and then you've got a longer-term payoff from the research. And this is really going to advance the science, and I think that this, this type of science is going to help pr uh, uh, protect lives and save, uh, protect property and save lives, and really improve our ability uh, in the sciences. Okay, uh, I'll spend a little time on the Global Hawk. This is this thing that this is the aircraft that's going to replace, essentially, uh, or it complement what we can do now with the G4 that goes around the system. Well, what's the big deal? Oh, by the way, this is a little bit of a joke here. These are unmanned systems, right? Unpersoned. I'm sorry, unpersoned systems. I don't know. I see a lot of people here, <laughs> and this is half the room. This is to operate the Global Hawk. So let's we can do a head count here. I, I, I see at least 30 people. So it's a little bit of a misnomer here. I mean, you, you, we're using technology to help us out, but people think unmanned, unperson, it, it, it's not, okay? Uh, you know, even for our small aircraft, we have to have people on the ground that are telling it where to go and how to work. It really, that's not the point of it. The point of it is to improve our capabilities, our current capabilities, right now to improve and hit gaps that we don't have. Well, what about these gaps? This is truly incredible. These are range rings. Here's the United States, obviously. This is where this Global Hawk can fly. So this ring here is a 20-hour loiter. It can go out here, fly there, and hang out for 20 hours. Now, remember, we fly out of Tampa with our P3. I'm telling you, I don't have a P3 range ring. We might be able to go here and stay three hours, and then we're out. And the nice thing about the Global Hawk, too, is that it actually has a tremendous amount of payload capabilities, over 1,000, 1,500 uh, pounds, which is not quite up to the P3, but it's certainly a whole lot more than the small aircraft, which, by the way, hold maybe a pound. So... They do different things, but really increase. Our, and these blue dots you see are where storms form. So they get us to areas we can't get, and when they get there, they stay there. Now, this doesn't go through the storm. So it's a complement to the low-altitude ones. But it gives us a, a really, not only just hits gaps, but it really expands our capabilities. Um, and they, they had a couple of missions. I've actually, I don't know if it made the news, uh, if you heard it here, but they, they actually flew the Global Hawk, First one was in this dying storm in the East Pacific because they wanted to make sure it would 
would work. And then when they got Hurricane Earl, um, which was a major hurricane, and, and you're saying, well, why are they operating in California? But you know, that's, the, that's the way NASA's doing it right now. They're operating out of Dryden. We hope to move it here to Wallops Island, which uh, that last range uh, map I showed you was assuming that we'd be on the East Coast for hurricane operations, which they plan on doing next year. A um, couple of just few slides left here. This is Hurricane Earl. This is truly a, 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 an amazing shot. This is over the storm. This is going at 60,000 feet. As I said, we can't use any sort of uh, aircraft at all that do this now. We have, actually we have the ER-2 can do that, it's, uh, it, it, but it doesn't, doesn't have the capabilities from a sensor standpoint or from an uh, observing standpoint. And this is a satellite picture at the, at the same time. Uh, and this is about 50 foot storm tops here. And actually, can get, one of the concerns is that we can get turbulence that actually could hit the aircraft and make it unstable. But in this case, we didn't hit that. Uh, and so they have about a 10,000 foot differential between the aircraft and the hurricane below it. Now this is interesting. This is definitely going out farther in the future. Um, obviously, we're, expense is an issue, but as far as capabilities, this is something that Boeing is putting together, um, and it uses hydrogen. Um, it, this thing is going to be able to, I think that's called the yeah, Phantom, Phantom Eye, and this thing is going to be able to stay up uh, for four days. So you're really going to get some capabilities that go beyond hurricanes. I said, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the storms and systems that I know, but this could be used for climate monitoring. This could be used for, for uh, many, many different uh, applications, civilian applications, non-military, which is nice. I'm sure there are going to be military operations too here. I, I think it's originally a spy aircraft. But again, we, 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 the scientists like to say, all right, you're going to spend that money. At least get, let's get something out of it later. Um, and this is something that I think the future will hold too. We have... In this case, it's a Global Hawk, but it doesn't really matter. Some sort of high-altitude uh, aircraft that then maybe launches a low-altitude aircraft, and they can do both. Right now, as I said, we're using, these, we're using unmanned systems to fill gaps. Jim did his prediction of the future. My prediction, it, it's uh, a little... Uh, my long-term prediction, for the, sh let's start, the short term, I think that it is going to fill gaps. We're still going to have manned aircraft that do a lot of things uh, in, in this field. But eventually... We're going to look at this as why. You know, the, the cost should come down. Uh, there's always danger when you use manned assets. Um, and I believe that we'll probably get to the point where we'll, we'll be in a full, fully automated system, whereby we'll, we'll still have people. When I say that, uh, you'll still have maybe that room of people you saw, but we won't have them out in harm's way. Um, so in summary, here are the, uh, the aircraft that we discussed today. Uh, I think, you know, the U.S. definitely has, we have really an impressive collection of manned aircraft right now. We do. But, and I think we'll, we'll, we'll continue to use that. Um, but I think that ultimately that probably will go away. Um, we will fill gaps. Um, and I think that we're going to have a combination of really hitting those high target areas, getting to areas where we can't otherwise reach, and getting those, that, that boundary layer region where the ocean and the atmosphere meet, that coupled area where uh, we really, I think we have a, a tremendous, it's a low-hanging fruit, if we can get the technology to let us observe there from a science standpoint. Um, I'm personally writing three or four papers just in that area right now with the data, that, the minimal data we have, and I think that it's something that, that really looks out beyond 10 to 15 years from now that we're really going to be um, making some gigantic leaps scientifically in that area. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Joe. Um, so next we have Chris Roman on, and uh, we're waiting for Chris Roman. There, uh, there's Chris. He's doing something. Chris, you're on. Can you hear us? Okay. I'm on the big screen. You're on the big screen. You're in a quarter of the big screen. Okay. Here we go. Um, so good evening. It's uh, uh, good to be joining you here from the coast of Sicily. Um, it's a little after 2 in the morning, and uh, I had an Italian gelato in my hand to prove I'm near Italy, but I got hungry and ate it during Jim's talk. So we'll just keep going. But uh, So you just heard two interesting talks focusing on marine robotics and aerial robotics. Um, I guess what I'd like to mention is a little bit about our ocean exploration program and where we see this going with the use of high bandwidth satellite communications and ship to shore really information and how that could affect oceanography in the future. So. Uh, what we'll do here is I'll voice over a few images uh, and videos, and then we'll move on to the question and answer period. So, like I said, I'm on the exploration vessel Nautilus. Um, we just completed a port stop in Trapani, Italy. Uh, we're heading south to the Straits of Sicily. Um, on that split screen, you saw 
uh, myself, um, the ship moving through the water, and a map of where we're going. So um, on board the ship, we have a team of scientists, students, engineers, technicians, two high school teachers, and of course, the ship's crew. Um, we've developed a cruise plan that'll take us um, south to some underwater volcanic features that have really only been mapped from a surface ship. And uh, so we really don't know too much about them at all on the seafloor. So we should be the first team to uh, get a look at these. So our primary tool we're using is a robotic vehicle we call Hercules. Um, it carries a variety of sensors, cameras, um, has two manipulator arms for sampling and handling tools. Um, and it can work to depths of 4,000 meters, or two and a half miles underwater. Um, it's piloted by the ship. And importantly to note, you know, there's no people in this, ve in this ve vehicle. Um, it's unmanned. Uh, and it, because it's unmanned, it can stay submerged and working for days at a time. Right? So we, in the control van here, just change out operators. Um, we run a 24-hour, schedule, 24 hour, seven day a week schedule. There's always something going on. Um, but we really, because we have uh, no people in the vehicle, can stay down for a long time and really get quite a bit of work done. Um, our second vehicle here is Argus. Um, it's attached to Hercules with a short tether, that yellow um, tether you're seeing there. And it also has cameras and lights and sensors and allows us to get a, a good view of Hercules working on the seafloor. Um, this vehicle is connected to the ship with a four kilometer long uh, cable, and that carries our fiber optic communications and our data. And so moving this whole operation from place to place requires coordination between the ship, um, Argus, and Hercules. So with this system, you know, we can bring live video and sensor data back from the vehicles um, up the uh, tether to the ship, um, off the ship with a satellite link, um, down to a ground station in the US, back to the uh, Inner Space Center at Rhode Island. Um, this is near the, the uh, Inner Space Center down at the Bay Campus in Narragansett. And here it's distributed on Internet 2, which is a high-speed version of um, the Internet linked to academic institutions, and also on the general public Internet. Um, through this system, we have two-way voice communication routed um, to the ship. Um, so remote scientists, uh, people not on the vessel in Rhode Island and really around the world can participate using a closed headset system as well as um, even basic phone lines. So we have a public website, um, the www.nautiluslive.org. And um, this is sort of the public face of our exploration program. And we've seen um, in the last year uh, 300,000 or more unique visitors to this website um, from 160 countries. And through our Ask a Questions link, um, we've answered, I think, more than now 100,000 questions uh, from the general public asked in real time. So people can go to this Send a Question link, and if they're watching the website, we'll get uh, a voiced answer and can watch live video from the seafloor. You know, we get questions ranging from what's for dinner um, to you know, what's the exact species of the animal you're looking at right now. So a wide range of interest uh, out there in the general public. Um, so for the past several years, um, we've been working in the Mediterranean, uh, Aegean, and Black Seas uh, on a variety of projects ranging from marine archaeology to geologic studies of submarine volcanoes to uh, the biology of deep coral reefs. Um, so I'll move on to a, a good example here of what we're really talking about, this exploration program and ship-to-shore uh, communication. So Last season, you'll see a map there with a big red star on it. We visited a place called the um, Eratosthenes, or Eratosthenes, as you may pronounce it, um, seamount um, near the island of Cyprus in the eastern Mediterranean. Um, and this was a, it's a good example for the use of remote scientists, because the Eratosthenes seamount is a piece of continental crust that's been tectonically drifting around the Mediterranean between Asia and North Africa on long geologic time scales. It's some 90 kilometers long and stands about two kilometers higher than the surrounding seafloor. Um, and from some prior work by scientists um, using basically shipboard sensors, they really um, had done some mapping and expected to find some pock marks, which are sort of uh, depressions in the seafloor created um, in areas of sedimentation where there could have been some gas coming out of the seafloor, sort of evidence of this um, piece of crusts um, geologic past. Um, so for this trip, we were pretty much a geology trip, and we had a boat full of geologists. But 
instead of finding sediment, we showed up and we found um, tube worms, and we found that the pock marks actually were instead limestone sinkholes, typical of karst topography. Um, so this was not something we expected. And uh, to answer some questions about the tube worms, we didn't really have an expert biologist on the ship. So we rung up a colleague um, over in Woods Hole who specializes in these organisms. And uh, with half an hour, uh, within half an hour, um, he was in front of his computer watching a live web stream and uh, was able to talk to us about what we were seeing, what he wanted to do with this program, and what he could do sampling-wise. So we put him uh, and his voice right in the ear of our pilots. And he was basically able to talk to the pilot or the operator of the Hercules vehicle um, and tell him exactly what to do remotely from his office uh, in Massachusetts. And you know, we were you know, somewhere off the island of Cyprus. So these colonies were really unknown before this trip. And uh, you know, it's a brand, it was a brand new discovery. It's quite interesting. And really sort of trying to change what our interpretations were for this whole geologic setting um, of this you know, the Eratosthenes Seamount. Right, so this really speaks to the general definition of exploration. You know, you're likely to find things if you, you were not expecting if you're exploring. Right? So we're trying to create this model of this, we've called it the doctors on call model, where we can get the appropriate experts in the game when it's important. Right? So we can develop strategies to um, respond appropriately for things that you're not expecting. So I'll give one other quick example here. Um, which is related to more, I guess you say, the general public. And this came through our, our Nautilus Live site in that this past year, we were doing a geologic survey um, on some seafloor between Turkey and Greece in the Aegean Sea. And, uh, and the sonar system came across a, a wreck of what looked like a modern ship. And uh, from the sonar system, we really couldn't tell. The sonar data, we couldn't really tell what it was. So we dove Hercules. You can see it there flying over the bow of this wreck. Um, and uh, a fellow in Greece on the island of Corfu was watching the live stream um, as we were working. And uh, through that ask a question link, he contacted the ship, except this time he didn't ask a question. He had the answer. He said, you know, you're looking at the uh, MS motor ship Dodecanesis that sank in 1958 on its way to Kos. Um, th this was a well-known wreck in the area, but was never found. Um, 1958 positioning was not that great, so uh, previous efforts to find it uh, were not successful. But he immediately recognized the vessel um, and scanned and then sent us the newspaper story about it. So someone you know, just randomly watching on the internet really added value to this whole effort. Um, a week or so later, we were contacted by the grandson of the ship's owner. Uh, and it, like, same person was also the great grandson of the captain who actually went down with the vessel in 1958. So I think this is you know suggestive of the you know potential involvement of the public and this public audience and you know, really in science in the moment I would say you know people watch these kind of things because they're interested you know they want to see and see what's new right there for the first time along with us right. So for tonight I think the question um, is really. What can we do with this in the next 10 to 20 years? So we just talked about ship-to-shore communications, robotic vehicles, an unmanned presence on the seafloor that's persistent, right? But I think the broad theme here is you know, connectivity and people to the oceans, right? Think about the level of connectivity in your daily lives right now, right? Especially what younger generations have come to expect, you know, email, texting, you know, exchanging information all the time, right? There's probably people in the audience who've been emailing since the start of the lecture. So, you know, People want data now. They want to be, really don't want to wait around for people to come tell them what was interesting and what. So, this is sort of what we're getting at: is we can get a large community of people involved, and people are interested in following what's live, especially when it's in terms of discoveries and finding new interesting things. So, you know, in the oceanographic community, I think, or at least my opinion is, you know, the days of sending three people alone in a submarine to work at the bottom of the ocean for eight hours while the rest of the world sits around and waits for them to come back and tell them what they found, I think you know, are badly justifiable today um, and certainly are not going to be in the near future. We just have too much we can bring to the table with robotics. So you know, systems like this, you know, we've been able to send people to really remote parts of the planet, but really carry along the intellectual support of a, of a much broader community, bringing in our doctors on call program. right? And I think this live mechanism does more for educational outreach 
where it really gets to the root of the engineering, science, mathematics, and the technical, the wow of the technical um, effort it takes to make this happen. I think, and that's a, a critical area for the for the country as a whole to really do everything we can to sort of um, bring this along and get um, people interested in these kind of things. Right? So. I think it's it's a little bit of a new direction for the oceanographic community, but I, I think I'm pretty confident that you know we will develop programs to use this remote situational awareness in a real meaningful way to sort of expand the arena of science um, that we can do. So I think it was my my first point. I think, and I'll, the second thing I think is if we link it back to autonomous vehicles, um, and what um, Jim was talking about is. You know, I think we're going to start seeing much better synergy between autonomous vehicles can do what autonomous vehicles can do well, um, and what humans can do when humans are in the loop. What I mean, what can people really do well? What do they bring to the table versus autonomous vehicles? So, you know, robots are really good in the robotics community. We call this the three Ds. You know, robots are good at doing the dull, dangerous, and dirty jobs, right? So surveying for uh, long times, flying out for 20 hours where humans are not going to be doing that in airplanes, swimming around for 1,800 kilometers. You know, that's not a job for humans to do in a submarine, right? People shouldn't be in, arm, in harm's way, and robots do a far better job at this than us. Humans, however, are really good at interpreting complex scenes, being dexterous, right, and really looking at a scene and, and and, and analy analyzing in real time what we want to do with that, especially in these complex environments. We want to take physical samples, right? So we do take a lot of samples in marine biology, geology, and chemistry, but robots aren't quite there yet. That's a very daunting task for these images you're seeing now, manipulators going out, picking up small things on the seafloor, taking uh, pieces of sediment. That is very challenging. but. I think what we're going to see instead is that we're going to have people doing these things, which are what humans are good at, and have the robots do the rest, right? So I think what we want to do really is we'll see a revolution in what we can do aboard ships with better technologies, what robots can do for us, and keep humans in the loop where it's really necessary, right? So I think soon we'll be doing DNA sequencing on ships. We'll be doing laboratory-grade science. We'll have more sophisticated tools for robots, and we'll be sending the data back to the beach, and we'll be getting broader pools of scientists involved through the communications we can bring from vessels. So in summary, I'll close with a few thoughts. And you know, it's really it's a big ocean out there, and the percentage of it that we've actually explored or got firsthand knowledge of the seafloor is absolutely minuscule, right? So it's clear, I think, that you know, robotics and especially the combination of robotics and communications are really the enabling technologies for the future. So I think we're going to see um, ships really increase their footprint. We're going to turn vessels and oceanographic ships like this one into really aircraft carriers that are going to carry robots and carry sensors, and they're going to let the people be in the loop where it's really important. Right? And so we're also going to get this data out through the communications to a broader That was his last line. <laughs> oh, there he is. <laughs> you, you disappeared for a minute, Chris, but you're back on. Oops. Hello? Chris. Sorry, are, are we dropping me for a second? Um, you're on, go ahead. Oops. OK, we're on. I'll finish up then. So yeah, I was just have a few thought, few thoughts just that, you know, these robotic tools, you know, are really going to, I think, hopefully increase the pace of discovery and help us answer some difficult questions that we really have about the planet and have to get solutions for now. So I think we're going to we're going to do a lot with these robotic tools and really push the communications. Um, but after that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Peter and uh, please join us for the next 10 days and um, actually till I think about November 19th on Nautilus Live, and we'll um, show you some new stuff. Thanks a lot, Chris. That was a great talk. OK, so I need the speakers up here. Um, we're going to spend the next maybe 15 to 20 minutes uh, answering questions uh, from the audience. Uh, and um, we're going to move the table over. And here we go. So this is sort of like Jeopardy. Mm -hmm. uh, 
we have Watson up there. Thanks. <laughs> and, um, okay. So um, we already have some questions. Uh, and this one isn't addressed to any, any one of you. Um, the first one is, uh, the now is exciting, and you've talked some about what you predict for the future, but what do you imagine could happen in these fields? What developments do you dream of? You want to start off, Jim? Uh, what developments do I dream of? In, in this field. Yeah, in this field. Well, I <laughs> well that cuts it down a little. <laughs> I, I think that... Uh, I guess that uh, what I personally, what I, what I would like to do is uh, I would like to spend a little bit more time uh, on the science. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, what's happening, I think, in the early stages of developing these platforms is uh, it is very challenging and it's all, all encompassing. And of course, you know, uh, in the early days, uh, it, it's not sort of broadly accepted by the community, so it, it takes all of your energy to sort of advance the technology, to raise the money, to pay for the team, and so on. And, and so as a consequence, I, I think you get wrapped up in a lot of uh, demonstration-type activities. Uh, you get, uh, uh, well, and, and you necessarily are working all of the bugs out of the system. And, and I think we're getting to the point now where a lot of these robotic systems, uh, we, I think we can really keep them at sea for quite a long period of time. And, and I'm sort of, in a way, sort of less interested, less and less interested in the robotic vehicle side of it than, than I am in the sensors. I, I think really right now, you know, we can drive a vehicle a really long way. We can keep it out at sea for a very long time. What I really need are some great sensors that tell me what's going on in the ocean with the biology, with the microbiology while we're out there. And so I think that some of the really exciting developments are going to, come, are going to be coming from, from the sensors and also maybe with the shoreside processing that help us sort of synthesize this into pictures of what's going on in that ocean environment. Yeah, I'd like to expand on that. I, I think that, um, you know, when you get new technology, you get the wow factor. I'm, I'm, I have that too. You know, you get something that you... We have it too. When the iPhone came out, people couldn't believe it, you know. And then you, you get new technology that, that really shakes you up at first. But then you, you get desensitized to that, and then you're almost dependent upon it, you know, to use the, to to think about the technology that's coming out now. Um, but in, in a lot of ways, that's a good thing. I think that if you look at what we're doing now with this technology, there's a lot of spin up. There's a lot of time invested. Hey, is this working? Is, can it work? We're demonstrating it. But I look forward to the point where it becomes routine. And I don't have to spend, let's say, you know, one-third or 20% of your time worrying about the collection of the actual data, but spending the time understanding it and making, making people's lives better, basically, by improving the understanding and really trying to advance the science. So I think once you get to the point where this is really just the pushing the edge of technology and you're always going to have a new wow, but you really, in the end, should improve your e efficiency. And I think that, that that is the exciting thing, because if you improve the efficiency, you can spend more time doing things that we're better at, we're scientists. Chris, do you want to take a stab at it? Uh, yeah, I'll, I think uh, I'll maybe you make two points here and echo what, what the other speakers just said. Is I think from the selfish robotics development side of me, I would say the, the game changer we're going to see and what I'm particularly excited about is advances in power. When you start with these systems, you're always doing the back of the envelope. How much energy can I afford to spend? How much battery power do I have at my disposal? And I think if we, can, if we ever got to 10 times the energy densities we can get now, I think you would see the floodgates open um, for the kinds of sensors you can move to these platforms and for how long these things can really be out there. Um, I think that's, that's a critical thing. And the second thing is I think we're going to run into, a, and we're starting to hit it already, just a data deluge. It's just how do you handle all the data that you can possibly bring back? Um, I work with a group, and, uh, and some of the data we do, uh, we take here on the Nautilus, we can do a survey in, in six or eight hours and generate 100,000 images of the seafloor. 
that's a lot of information to deal with. So we're going to have to develop tools to sort through this. And really just figuring out how do you piece through all these things and put all this information together is a, is a really big challenge. I think it's going to be exciting to see how do we tease really interesting bits of data out of all the data we can, or out of interesting bits of understanding out of all the data we can really collect now. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> Lost my place here. Um, yeah, actually this is another question for well, I guess it's for all of you in a way. Um, what, why exactly is it important to map out things like the seafloor and the sea surface? So we might as well start with Chris on the seafloor. Who cares? Go. So I guess the question is, you know, why map out the seafloor and what kind of resolutions are, are necessary? And I guess I, I maybe the simplistic argument is that um, we're pushing mapping technologies now where we've gone from satellites, which actually can tell you something about the seafloor, sea to ships, which give you a, a resolution that's slightly better, um, to sort of order meters. With vehicles, you can get down to tens of centimeters, and with some things we're working on right here and other groups, you can get down to sub-centimeter, millimeter level maps of the seafloor. And I guess I've really have faith in the complexity of the world that as soon as you can create a technology to get a better look at something like the seafloor, you'll learn something. And these range from, you know, fine understanding of, um, of micro of structure on the seafloor, roughness on the seafloor, the interaction of chemistry, biology on the seafloor. Um, there's relevant questions at all these scales, and I think we're really just starting to get a handle on how to efficiently collect this data. And I think, again, it goes back to this sort of data deluge. We can really get more data now than we've ever been able to get before. And I think it's going to enable more questions really that aren't, or, yeah, we're going to be able to do more things that aren't even really in people's head, because I think, in heads, because I think if we can get this information, there's always going to be something new that we're going to observe when you get a better look at the seafloor. Do any of you want to, do either of you want to take a stab at the surface? Well, I, actually, I, I, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll mention really sort of two, two themes here. You know, one is if you, if you think in terms of, of uh, wanting to understand global climate, uh, you really uh, cannot understand global climate if you don't understand the, the dynamics of the ocean, and not just the dynamics of the ocean, but the dia dynamics of the organisms in the ocean. So the carbon cycle closes through the ocean in ways that we do not understand, and which are re largely mediated by microbes uh, who we don't even know who they are or what they do. Uh, we're only in the last decade or so developing the tools to understand, uh, understand and, and uh, deduce the presence of those organisms uh, much less understand how micro microbial communities evolve, and we do know they evolve very quickly. So I would say that, you know, from one, from one perspective, you simply cannot claim to understand the planet if you don't understand the dynamics of the ocean, and in particular, the dynamics of the living part of the ocean. And I say that as a physicist, by the way. Uh, painful, though. Uh, <laughs> I hope none of my microbial uh, biologist uh, friends are in the audience here tonight, or I'll have to buy them a beer. Um, <laughs> I think that though the, the better answer really came from the class today. We were having a conversation in the class, and, and I, I would rephrase the question as really, uh, how do you value what you don't understand? Uh, how, do you, how do you assign value to that? How do you know whether the damage you're causing is damage which, uh, which is, which is uh, going to affect your future or your children's future? Uh, it's, something, it's something that we should think about very carefully. And uh, the example that was given was a mold. You know, we were talking about valuing, valuing life on the planet. Well, you know, you say, someone pointed out, well, maybe we don't want to value a, a viruses. Well, what about mold? Uh, mold, you know. Well, mold, of course, is, is what gave us uh, penicillin. It's one of the great uh, life-saving uh, drugs in, in human history. And so I think, that, I think the ocean is mostly not understood. And as a consequence, its value we really can't assign. Uh, but it is most of the planet, uh, and we can be sure that it is important for our children, and so we have to understand it. And I think now we finally are going to be, begin to have the tools. It, it is a bit of a race, though, because, because uh, although the ocean is invisible to us, we're not invisible to it. We're changing it, uh, making large transformations in the ocean. And we need to understand those in order to manage our interaction with it wisely. 
Uh, this question is probably directed to Joe. Do you have, uh, do any, well, it says do any of you have experience or thoughts on Lagrangian atmospheric floats, especially those that control al altitude? Especially, you, especially yeah. what? Those that control altitude. At controlled altitude? Uh, that control altitude. Oh, um, well, actually, one of the slides I had, I had uh, several iterations of that presentation, and there were other things that we're doing that weren't necessarily aircraft. And um, we have some tetroons that, uh, we, that essentially are Lagrangian floats, and we're trying to get them to go where we want them to go, if you will. So I think there's some um, use for, for uh, Lagrangian-type atmospheric floats. I guess also oceanic floats, you get drifters too. You, the, you can kind of lump the two together. Uh, I won't speak from the, from the ocean side, but there are limitations with that type of uh, uh, device because, you know, like in the end, it's going to go where it wants to go. You can, can try to control the altitudes. Uh, there have been several experiments that have tried to do that. Uh, the most promising one is something that's being developed now. Um, uh, it's called Aero Clipper, where it's a, essentially a, a, a tetroon that is tethered and it has a, a drug into the water, but uh, it's, it's near impossible for that drug to, 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 you know, for the tetroon to just go up, but it's enough that the, the currents or the winds, either way, can push the, can push the uh, uh, balloon to where you want it to go. And this effort was, they try to do this to try to get it, again, it, the reason I know about it is they're trying to get this into the eye of a hurricane. Um, so I think there's some uh, application for this, but it might be limited. Uh, the, the, the benefit is that the cost is quite low to do something like that. So it would have to be a specific application. Okay, here, here is one um, that might set you back a bit, <laughs> one of you. It seems to be directed to Jim. Do you think robots, such as those on the ocean floor or elsewhere, will ever become sentient? Ooh. <laughs> Uh, but I, I, want, I want to take a shot at that. Too. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, and I'll bet you Chris has opinions there, too. Uh, I, I think, uh, do I have, think they'll become I, sentient? Wow. Uh, you know, actually, I have to admit, I read enough science fiction that I think I intrinsically believe that uh, eventually a sentience, you know, is possible in, you know, in silicon or whatever the computational, whatever the computational uh, foundation is. I mean, it's biological in us. Uh, whether or not it is ethical to create sentient creatures uh, maybe is another interesting question. Uh, so so uh, you certainly would want them to enjoy their environment. <laughs> uh, but I, yeah, I, I, uh, that's, a, uh, that's a good question. I think, I, think, yeah. I think, yeah, I think that you know, at some point in the future, I don't know when, because I think sentience is still a mystery to us. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think it's. I think it's possible. So Joe wants to go. I, I don't know. I, I. I don't. I love Terminator. Don't get me wrong. But <laughs> you know, I watched. I've watched every iteration of that. But I, the thing that always struck me that was the the dissension part of it. It's like okay, you can get an advanced, advanced, advanced technology. It's sort of like how we're creating life. I, I guess we're getting philosophical. A lot of these answers are philosophical. But you know, you can have all these complex DNA comp, um, formulations. But getting that string to replicate, still haven't been able to do that. So when you said, can we create sentient, I don't know if we have the ability to create something sentient anyway. And then the other part of it too is, <clears throat> where does, you know, sentient denotes some, some sort of desire, some sort of, um, you know, uh, self-awareness. And I, I don't know, I, I guess, I don't know, maybe we can program something like that, but I don't see how a, a robot that's down there and is doing its job suddenly goes, man, I hate this stuff. You know, I, 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 it's going to break before that happens. Uh. Um, uh, Chris, do you want to take a shot at this? Um, the thing that popped into my head, my head was what Joe just said. I think, you know, we're going to build a robot and you say, okay, you're going to send me down there. It's deep, it's dark, it's cold. It's really under a lot of pressure. Why am I going? <laughs> Okay, let's go with a couple more questions and then we'll call it quits. Um, can the technologies you're developing in ocean robotics and mapping be applied to other areas of life? And what are some examples, if you think they are? 
I guess this probably would start off with Chris and then maybe move on to one of the others. Or both of the others. Um, yeah, I think the, the real challenge in marine robotics is, uh, is the complexity of the, of the environment. And I think the robotics community in the, in the marine area I think differs from the land robotics community in some degree in that we're focused on really unstructured, time-varying, complex scenes. And I think what we'll learn about how to build robots that can make smart choices and do adaptive sampling and really work on their own behalf to get better data will have applicability in a lot of other areas uh, for terrestrial robotics. Um, I think it really speaks to the it's a challenge for these complex systems, and I think we'll be able to take a lot of what we learn in the complexity of the ocean and apply it to other settings. Do either of you want to take a quick stab at it? Well, so I, part of the reason why I got into robotics in the marine environment was uh, because it's a place where uh, robotics is just desperately needed. Even simple tasks uh, are useful. And so as a consequence, I see it as kind of a proving ground uh, for, for robotics. As a matter of fact, uh, we have a lot of interaction with the space community. NASA Ames is just up the road from us. Uh, we interact with those folks all the time. I've actually stolen people from, uh, from NASA on a number of, uh, on a number of occasions. And, and most people uh, actually think of spacecraft as being autonomous, but in fact that is largely not the case. It's only very recently that they've allowed a, a spacecraft to make a decision about even twitching without, without a human operator on the ground uh, deciding it. Autonomy was something that really was required in the ocean much sooner because, uh, because we couldn't plan ahead and uh, predict what our, what our vehicles were, were going, to, going to encounter. So I think that, and, and I, you know, I really got into it on the high level code side, so on the code for for, for making these systems autonomous. And uh, I, I think that maps across into into a lot of other domains. And equally, we learn from them. We learn from them as well. So uh, you know, we, are, we are not an island. <laughs> OK, so we'll have one more very quick question for Chris. Um, apparently, there are some people who still don't believe that we've landed on the moon. Uh, <laughs> are you really in a trailer just behind the building here? <laughs> we don't see you rocking, Chris. Uh, no. <laughs> Yeah. We were rocking quite a bit the last few days, and I, I, I really would have wished to have been in a trailer behind the, the building. But uh, no, we are really at sea, and uh, you can follow us. Uh, it's, a, it's, it, it's quite exciting out here, and uh, I think you know, we'll show you some good images next few days. Okay, so thank you very much. Before we thank the speakers tonight, we'd like to show you a short video about the uh, presentation that we'll have next Tuesday night, a week from tonight, uh, by Ed Boyden. Uh, and so, can we have the video? Have you ever just woken up in a bad mood? Minute one and you already feel like crap. Nothing has happened to you yet. No one spilled coffee on your new shirt, no one sat down on your cat or stole your car. You're just trying to enjoy a nice peaceful sleep and your body and your brain decide to drop the ball. Luckily, people like Ed Boyden are tired of this crap. If your brain doesn't want to play ball, then it's time to install fiber optic cables into your head that shoot lights at your genetically modified brain cells. You know, the next logical step. Unfortunately, shooting lights at the brain, as fun as that might sound, is not enough to control it. In order to control it, Boyden and his team had to create a brain switch, something they could use to turn things they didn't want to happen off and leave things they did want to happen on. So how do you create a brain switch? Well, first, Boyden uses a specific type of algae that converts light into electricity. This alga has an eye spot that is covered in little proteins that react when they're hit by blue light. In other words, this alga turns on when hit by blue light. But how do you get your neurons to also turn on when hit by blue light? Well, the second step is to take the DNA from the alga, insert it into a virus, and then send that virus at your neurons. Your neurons, the idiots that they are, get all excited, absorb the DNA, and start to produce the same blue light sensing proteins all over themselves. Now when that neuron is hit by a blue light, it also turns on. Unfortunately, there's no built-in light system in your brain, and so there's nothing to shoot light at your neurons. To remedy this problem, Boyden creates a contraption made of blue light firing fiber optic cables and puts that into your head. 
It's sort of like a hat, but a little more intrusive. Finally, Boyden's brain switch is complete. You can now select specific types of neurons in whatever part of your brain to turn on or to leave off. What nefarious ends is this brain switch being used for, you might ask. But come on, don't get ahead of yourself. You see, in one experiment, nay, pre-clinical trial, Boyden cures mice of their post-traumatic stress disorder. Wow, what a nice guy, right? Well, you might be wondering, and probably legitimately, where one even finds mice with PTSD, at the local mouse clinic perhaps, or maybe in hawk-infested forests. Well, not exactly. You see, Boyden takes normal mice and puts them in a cage. He then attaches the cage with a device that plays a sound and then shocks the mouse. So every time the mouse hears the sound, it gets shocked. Once the mouse is deemed sufficiently traumatized, they start playing the sound without the shock. But the mouse still reacts with fear when it hears the sound, as it has learned to expect a shock. Now comes the cool part. Boyden and his team find the part of the brain that they need to turn on to negate the mouse's fear, and they then blast that part with their blue lights. When they do this, and then play the sound, the mouse no longer shows any fear of shock. His PTSD has been cured, and his mind has been controlled. I can't think of any possible way that this could be misused. To learn more about Ed Boyden and his experiments, visit uri.edu hc. So that, that was put together by one of the students in our honors class, the same one who did the teaser that we had in the beginning. Uh, and it's really a pretty accurate um, summary of what we'll be seeing uh, next week. So in closing, I would really like to thank our three speakers, one of whom is gone now. <laughs> but thanks, Jim, Joe, and Chris. <laughs>